I was teaching at NYU and also working with a lot of startups and incubators. And then I did something about 10 years ago that I did not intend to be a meaningful part of my life at all. For context, I had known, as long as I can remember, I knew that there were environmental issues in our world with plastics and deforestation and pollution and, and, and global warming and sea level rise. But I thought, I mean, we all know a million reasons why not to do anything. The plane was going to fly anyway. Individual action doesn't matter. And I felt all of them at some point. Nonetheless, I noticed how much garbage I produced in my apartment. And in particular, most of it was packaging from food. So I just gave myself this one challenge, which was to go for a week without buying any packaged food. And I had, I really expected it to be an unpleasant experience. I used to eat ice cream all the time, like every day. And in comparison, apples tasted bland. I would think apples were like, just kind of like the boring fruit. They were like the regular ones, not like a mango or something really more interesting. But now, apples to me now taste sweeter than ice cream used to. Welcome to Inspire Someone Today podcast, a show where we dive into the stories and insights that has the power to create ripples of inspiration in your life. I'm your host, Srikant, and I'm thrilled to be with you on this journey of inspiration. Hey, my dear listeners, welcome back to another episode of Inspire Someone Today. We are continuing our focus on sustainability. We had Loana Davis in the last episode and I'm excited to have yet another voice of sustainability leadership. I'm glad to have Joshua Spodek as the guest on this episode of Inspire Someone Today. Joshua is an award-winning podcaster. This Sustainable Life podcast is his podcast. He's a four-time TEDx speaker, best-selling author of Leadership Step-by-Step. And on his way to create yet another book around sustainability leadership. It's an absolute joy and pleasure to have you, Josh, on this episode of Inspire Someone today. Glad to be here. I've been looking forward to this. So, Josh, as I mentioned, you are one of those premier voice in the field of sustainability. Even before we get there, could you share with me and my listeners the background of how all of this led you to do what you are doing? and your focus on leadership and environmental action. I mean, if you look back at my academic background, I got a PhD in physics. I helped build a satellite that's orbiting the earth. I left academia to start my first company and we had our ups and downs that led me back to business school. In business school, I took classes. I discovered, I had no idea that there were classes in leadership until I found them at business school. And I was frankly skeptical of, I always thought either you have it or you don't. Like Martin Luther King, he had it so he could lead. I didn't, so I couldn't. And when I finished business school, I found that these classes were very, very interesting. You could develop social and emotional skills. One could change, I could change my identity deliberately. And so after business school, I continued to start some other companies, but in the background, I was like, if you had met me 15 years ago, I was going around to start a school for leadership. Like I, I was teaching at NYU and also working with a lot of startups and incubators. And then I did something about 10 years ago that I did not intend to be a meaningful part of my life at all. For context, I had known, as long as I can remember, I knew that there were environmental issues in our world with plastics and deforestation and pollution and, and, and global warming and sea level rise. But I thought, I mean, we all know a million reasons why not to do anything. The plane was going to fly anyway. Individual action doesn't matter. And I felt all of them at some point. Nonetheless, I noticed how much garbage I produced in my apartment. And in particular, most of it was packaging from food. So I just gave myself this one challenge, which was to go for a week without buying any packaged food. And I had, I really expected it to be an unpleasant experience. Well, it was at the beginning because I, it, it cost more time. In my, like, I didn't really know what to do, but I stuck with it after the week ended and learned how to cook from scratch. Now, th- th- that was like a several month process involving a lot of bland food. But when, after what I now would call my withdrawal from a dependence on prepackaged stuff and takeout, I found that my food was faster, more convenient, cheaper, healthier, more delicious. It was more social because I invited people over more and we could spend time together and not at a restaurant where they're trying to shoo us out or it's noisy. And this was very surprising to me because I thought that every message that I'd gotten told me that this would be a bad experience. And I look back and realized, now I'm kind of simplifying a bit here. 
every message I'd ever gotten on sustainability said, we have to sacrifice. We have to give up things that we like. And here I enjoyed the experience. So a couple of things happened. One, I started experimenting more. What more could I do? What more joy could I find? Totally different experience. Seeking joy is very different than complying with what I'm told I have to do. The other thing was the leader in me saw that there was intrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation is very different than extrinsic. You can lead someone, you can inspire someone with intrinsic motivation, but with extrinsic, you, it's carrots and sticks. You, you can manage, but not really lead. And the entrepreneur in me said, there's huge demand, I think. I think people don't want to pollute as much as they are. I think they want to contribute to the solution, not just the problem. And so I think there's high demand and low supply. So I started also looking into how can I help people transitions I have, and not just people, but nations and humanity. So that began a process of me living more sustainably on my own. I mean, I can't lead others to live by values that I don't live by myself. And more importantly, every change you make in a culture that is not sustainable, that values lots of things that are only enabled through polluting, every step you take is like a challenge. I get pushed back everything I do. And someone's got to be the explorer because it's not hard to do the things. It's hard to transition. It's hard to face the resistance. So I started developing workshops, in my podcast, and now I lead people through a process of a mindset shift to where they expect living more sustainably is actually going to be joyful. And that's through the mindset shift is through a process called the, the Spodic Method. And that leads people onto a process of continual improvement where they just step by step start doing more and more things. And what it looks like in their life is unique to them. It's different than what it looks like for me. But everyone who does it gets this effect of like, oh my God, I could have been doing this a long time. Why didn't I start this earlier? Why did I believe what everyone was telling me that it would be so bad? And they don't usually focus on the things that the articles that say, here's 10 little things for the environment. It doesn't usually start with straws. It starts with, actually, it starts with their in intrinsic motion, emotions, like what matters to them. I've gone over two minutes. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm very enthusiastic about this stuff yeah. and I really love it. Uh, I, I can definitely sense that. And in all our three conversations, that's the uh, very gist of it. You make two very valid points uh, here, Josh. One mm -hmm. is you s the notion around sustainability is that if change were to happen, it has to be big. And that put a lot of pressure that doesn't let a lot of folks to move forward because they say, what is that incremental change that I can do that may not have any impact on the world around me? So that's one piece. The second piece that you have repeatedly called out and also in your TED talk is people don't want to do small things, but they want to do meaningful things. Can you just touch upon both of these elements? Can small change lead to a big change? And what's the difference between not doing small things, but doing meaningful things? All right, I'll answer that question. Then I'm going to, after that, make sure I come back to the bigger point that's underlying it. That's really, that people don't notice so much. But yeah, if you tell someone, if your goal is to lead people through seeking compliance, through coercing them, through cajoling them, through convincing them. If you ever think to yourself, let me convince someone of something, you're going to be motivating them. You might come in with a bunch of facts and knowledge that's useful, but if you're coming through to convince, the vince in convince is the same as in vanquish. You're trying to beat them and it provokes them to argue back. We have a whole world of people just arguing with each other about this stuff. And even though everyone likes clean air, clean water, clean food, clean land, because pushing someone, convincing, cajoling, people resist that. They don't want to, you, know, you might get them to comply in the short run, but you know, say, to say meatless Mondays is like saying, you know you want to eat meat and I know you want to eat meat. Well, I want to eat it, but we have to do this. It sucks. Can you try not eating meat for one day and maybe you'll consider it for another day? No one ever says seatbelt Tuesdays or drinkless driving Wednesdays. No one ever says, oh, I know you like to drink and drive. But why not try drinking, driving sober one night a week? Maybe you'll like it. No, we say always drive sober. Never drink and drive. Never, don't like half, halfway do it. If you just always put your seatbelt on. Like, I don't know about you. When I get in the car, I just put the seatbelt on. I don't think twice about it. I always put it on. I don't put it on sometimes because I know it's always better on. So when we're trying to cajole people, we try to get them to do these little things. I know you don't want to do it. So we reinforce the beliefs that are driving it from a management perspective. It might work. Oh, we got compliance. From a leadership perspective, we often reinforce the beliefs that they don't want to do it. Whereas if you find intrinsic motivation, and everyone has intrinsic motivation relevant to the environment, everyone has some experience in nature with their pet, with some delicious food, something that nature provided that they really love. 
And maybe it's less available now than it was when they were a kid. Or, I mean, you have to have the individual conversation with each individual person to find out what motivates that person relevant to the environment. But when you give them a way to act on what they care about inside, then it's meaningful. It may be big, it may be small, but if they like it, they'll find it meaningful. They'll want to do more. So people consistently commit to doing something and whether it's big or small, I don't care because they come back and they almost always do more than they said they would after doing it through the Spodic method. You know, it's not just casually, this is something that took years to refine, but when they do it for meaningful reasons, they can feel inspired. They do more than they said. They, they come back and they say, what more can I do? They research on their own what they can do more. So as long as we stick with this compliance stuff, we imply they don't want to do it. We reinforce their beliefs that they don't want to do it. And they don't do it. You know, they might comply, but then they feel like, oh, I did seven things out of the 10 things the article said I'm supposed to. So that's a good passing grade. I'm mm-hmm. one of the good guys. I'm done. Whereas when it's meaningful, they're like, what more can I do? How much difference have I made? How much more difference can I make? So a lot of people say, oh, if a lot of people do little things, it'll add up. I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. But through this product method, by going through meaningful, working with intrinsic motivations, they'll do more and more and more of themselves and they'll share it with others. And if they take my workshop, then they can learn how to teach others. And if you're sharing with something that you love and they get feel gratitude, then you share how to do it, then they share with others and so on and so on. And that's a recipe for viral growth. Now, the bigger thing underneath this that I was alluding to is that when people say why they don't do things, and I'm going to say something very general about a human motivation, is that people, we generally choose based on our intuitions, not logic, not reason. I mean, logic and reason inform these things, but usually the logic and reason is after we've made the decision, it, we rationalize and justify why that choice was the right choice. When we live in a world where it's very easy to do the thing that pollutes, to do polluting things, to do depleting things, we may feel like, oh, I shouldn't do this. But once we choose to do it, then our minds kick in and say, here's why it was okay to do it. And so people usually give reasons. All right, so it's very easy to keep polluting. We get takeout. We buy the big SUV. We want to show our spouse that we love them. And so we buy some little trinket on the way home that will 30 seconds of, of smile, and then it's going to be in a landfill for a thousand years. We know there's something off about these things, but everyone around us is doing it. And so we do it and we rationalize and justify. And then we say, that's why we did it. So when people say, oh, it has to be really big, or they're often saying, here's why I'm not doing it yet. And it's usually justifying something that's just going with the flow. And I'm a big fan of going with the flow. I'm not trying to challenge everyone and everything, but sustainability is a pretty big issue. I mean, one of the big issues making it important is that it's, it's front page news weekly, almost daily, and everyone knows those headlines are going to increase for our entire lives. Yep. And we're all living through some of this, isn't it? Yeah. With, and if, with some of the temperature changes that is happening, is just a... Well, the I, okay, of- I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but does a temperature change? That's the external stuff. It's the internal stuff that we're contributing to it. We know it. And whatever excuses we give, we can't look our children in the eye and say, I'm doing everything I can to make the world better for you. We feel like if the future, if there's no chance for the future being better than today, what hope do we have? People feel full of hopelessness and despair and helplessness. And this philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. There's no trying to, I mean, they might have some passionate work. They want, of course, they want to do what they can for their kids, but they've given up on this giant thing that's front page news all the time. And that's why people like my workshop so much is that it puts them on a path of continual improvement themselves and shows them how they can help contribute to a global movement that improves all of these things on an increasing scale all the time that we enjoy. And it's contrary to what every message I'd ever gotten up until that first experiment of mine that it's burdensome and it's not burdensome. It just, it's different than our current culture, but our current culture has some big issues. I mean, suicide rates are high and everyone knows about these, you know, ADHD and all these people have a lot of anxiety. People have a lot of fear, hopelessness and helplessness and lack of meaning and purpose. I'm not saying that they have meaning and purpose in lots of areas of of their lives, but it's corrosive that we live as long as we keep participating in a culture that's polluting and depleting. And for that matter, addicting. And for that matter, imperialist, like, the rich countries are getting so much from the poor countries and impoverishing them. And we're contributing to that. And we don't have to. And I'm sharing a way out that's based in joy and intrinsic motivation and meaning. So aligning with that, you did mention a couple of times about the Spodek method. 
for the benefit of our listeners, if you were to share a very high level view of what that method is and how can one go about looking into that aspect of uh, the Spodek method? Well, at, the, at a very low level, it looks like if someone was looking at it through a camera, they would see two people having a conversation about 20 minutes long. And then one of them does something that they committed to during that conversation. And then after it's done, maybe a week later, they have a second conversation. And that's also 15, 20 minutes. Now, sometimes they go on longer because it can spark real discovery in people and it can go for hours. But the core of it is can be done in as soon as 15 or 20 minutes. And inside that first conversation, the beginning is to ask questions in a supportive, non-judgmental way. So the first person I call the leader and the second person I call the actor. So the leader leads the actor to share their experiences about the environment or one particular experience usually that they come up with that is a memorable experience that that often formative. So for many people, it's different for everyone. If you grew up by the beach, it might be, be beach related. If you grew up in the mountains, it might be mountain related. If you grew up in the city, it might be, you know, that soccer field at the end of the block where you used to play, or it might be food related. It's just something where they weren't really, where they weren't polluting. They were something usually calm or serene in nature, but sometimes it's awe inspiring. And, and then you, the leader talks with the actor and emerges, what emerges is the sensory experience and then the emotions relevant to like, what emotions did the person feel in that experience? Was it serenity? Was it calmness? Was it relaxation? Sometimes it's awe. Sometimes it's a sense of oneness and connection with with everyone. Oftentimes it's curiosity. Again, different for everyone, for every experience. I mean, if it was someone's experience hiking in the woods, it might be accomplishment, or maybe they reach the mountaintop and they feel like grandeur if they look, but maybe it's just, they would go to the beach and they could close their eyes and hear the, the waves lapping. And then once that emotion is, the person is feeling it. The next big thing in the Spodak method is to ask them to come up with a a way that they could manifest that emotion these days in their lives. You know, if it was a beach related thing and they don't live near the beach, it's not saying go to the beach. It's saying, can you create that calmness in your life here and now? And it's sometimes challenging because the person feels like, well, I'm supposed to, I know I'm supposed to pick up litter or I know I'm supposed to turn off my laptop when I'm not using it, but this isn't an exercise to do something for the environment, to create emotions that the person likes. And so say it's something of, of serenity, then maybe the person will, oftentimes people have been meaning to do something like they, they might say, oh, I've been meaning to start a meditation practice. I'll, I'll meditate or serenity. It might be they'll, I don't know, it depends on the person. And they come up with something that they're, that they commit to doing. And then they agree to meet after the person does, the actor does the thing. So the actor then goes off and maybe they're going to, uh, one that someone did recently was they drive around doing errands and they committed to biking instead of driving. And anyway, so th- they'll go and like, they'll bike in- instead of drive to do the local errands. And then a week later, they talk about how the experience was. And they're not just doing something. They're doing something to create emotions, to connect with an experience they had that was a, a formative, meaningful experience before. And the second conversation is usually a really joyful thing. So the leader then walks the actor through what the experience was like, uh, what the emotional experience of this, of this, their commitment was. And oftentimes the person did more than they said they would. They liked it more. They shared it with other people. They're often open to doing something more. And the big thing is that they, there's this mindset shift. At the beginning, it's small. You know, when it, it's like a path, it just diverges a little bit, but it keeps diverging to what more might I be able to do? What other things can I do? Like one guy committed to picking up litter every day for 30 days. And by the end of it, he had stopped eating meat. And he, he was a uh, weightlifter. So his, like, car, his, um, he had to research how to make sure that his diet was, had the same macros that it did before. I didn't talk to him about diet at all. He just did that on his own because he wanted to. He also mentioned about the litter. When he started picking up litter, he, was, he felt, oh, what if someone I know sees me? I might feel embarrassed. But by the end, he, he wanted people to see him. And I've gone through that transition too because I pick up litter every day. So talking about it, by the way, is like talking about music. It's like, I can tell you what Beethoven sounds like, but you got to hear it. So mm-hmm. it's really the emotional experience that the person has that's what this is all about. So what I told you, I apologize. I, I, I know no way of giving a listener to just casually listen to this the experience of what it's like. Although if you go to my podcast, This Sustainable Life, I'm coming up on 800 episodes. So I've done it hundreds of times with lots of people. And sometimes it works well. Sometimes it doesn't work well. But you can hear me doing it with like very famous people, CEOs and elected officials and 
movie stars and star athletes. And because I, I want to do it with influential people that people look up to, that people can follow. And you can hear me doing it with all these people. You can hear the first conversation, the second conversation. If you listen to very early episodes, you can hear me still developing the Spodic method because in the early ones, I was really cajoling and, con- and convincing. And I learned how to do this through applying my leadership skills and experience to sustainability. So it's all based in theory and effective practice and trial and error, but there's lots of examples there. And it definitely ensure that we direct our listeners to your podcast. And while doing all of these things, you made a big transition from being an astrophysicist to now teaching at school plus doing what you're doing. What challenges did you face when you were transitioning from these roles to what you are doing today? And how do you see this in hindsight of what those challenges and what you think could have better prepared for you to do what you're doing in current day? Well, if I look at just the transition to sustainability leadership, because before I did that experiment and found the intrinsic motivation, I was having a great time because I felt leadership was to learn the social and emotional skills of leadership, of self-awareness and self-expression and listening, empathy, compassion. You know, I'm no Buddha here, but I'm far farther along than I was when I started. And I'm I found that it could be done deliberately. To transition to sustainability leadership, the most, I really would have expected the challenges would be technological or if I wanted to get a law passed, like how do I get elected or how do I get my officials to listen to me? It's much, much more social. It's much more about the resistance that everyone around me gives me at almost every turn. And I'm not just talking about my mom, but it comes a lot from family of these challenges are like, okay, so after that first experiment of avoiding packaged food, I went from throwing out my garbage once a week to once every other week to once a month to once every three months to once every six months. So now I'm in my fifth year on one load of garbage because I don't buy stuff online. I don't buy packaged food. And so I get very little garbage. And that led to avoiding flying for a year. I challenged myself to for one year of no flying. And that was going to be Really, I thought it was going to be the worst year of my life and it ended up being an incredible experience. So I haven't flown since 2016 and I didn't intend to not fly ever again. But the more that I go without flying, everyone sees flying as bringing them to someone far away, but it doesn't, it separated us in the first place. So I see fly, like I cannot communicate how my views of these things have changed that because there is, it's just constant resistance from culture. But I know that, I mean, I've lived overseas at times in my life. And if I'm going to live in Tokyo and I really want to live like a New Yorker in Tokyo, it's really hard because you can't get bagels in Tokyo. I think, I mean, people get bagels and pizza on the street here. I don't get them, but it's tough to live like a New Yorker in, to- in, in Tokyo. But if you live like, if you switch and live like a Tokyo person in Tokyo, it's easy. Likewise, if you try to live like a Tokyo person in, in New York, it's going to be hard because I don't know what they have there that we don't have here, but it's going to be hard to do some things that there are normal. The transition is really hard and pushing against resistance is hard. I know that living sustainably isn't hard. Living sustainably amidst a culture that is not sustainable is hard. And it grinds on you. I want to give up almost every day. But I also use the social emotional skills, the internal skills of how to trend, how to, when I feel despair, how to take the magnitude of that emotion, keep it, but channel it into dedication and discipline. And and that's a big key piece of it is, and also forming community is once I've done the Spodic method with, I don't know, five or six people, and now I've done it with so many people around me, I have, a, I have a lot of people around me who are on this path of continual improvement. So now I feel like I'm swimming downstream. But at the beginning, it was feeling like swimming upstream all the time. And people feel like they're helping me by saying things like, oh, just fly, just enjoy life. But it's, yeah, they can't see the joy that I have in learning and connecting with people around me and nature around me and not feeling like nature is only somewhere far away and things like that. And absolutely right there, Josh, like you mentioned, a lot of the times it's a resistance that you got to face. Once you kind of overcome that resistance, probably it's a lot more easier than that initial inertia that gets created. I don't want to paint too rosy a picture. I still face resistance all the time from family, from, it's mostly from family. It's a lot of it from there. But, um, the community, once a few people around you are on board, that's the biggest thing by far. Then you have a tribe. Then you have mutual support. And also I do these workshops that after the workshops end, we do them online and the people still meet. There's these alumni group where we get together and we talk about the challenges that people are facing, the new things that we're doing, the next workshops coming up. And 
some of the people who did workshops become TAs and then become workshop leaders themselves. So it's that piece is the biggest piece of it is when you've got other people on board. And there's this growing group of people that are like, oh my God, finally, I have people that I can do this with and, and enjoy it and not get pushed back. Well, while we spoke about the challenges, the resistance it has, at the same time, what are some of the small little things that you have done or you have seen your group or community done to overcome some of these resistances? What are those small changes that they have been able to do for them to go down the path where they are in line with their intrinsic motivation? Well, you asked about small, but that's not the point. It's meaningful. It's, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is not a small thing, but my food is much more fresh fruits and vegetables that I make myself. And everyone thinks it's harder or more expensive or less convenient. And it's the opposite. So, I mean, if people come over and I want to make a big show of cooking, I can take hours to cook a meal. But if it's just me and I'm, I'm in a hurry, I can just throw stuff together much faster than I could before. I don't have all this garbage to take out. And the food tastes so much better. I used to eat ice cream all the time, like every day. And in comparison, apples tasted bland. I would think apples were like just kind of like the boring fruit. They were like the regular ones, not like a mango or something really more interesting. But now apples to me now taste sweeter than ice cream used to. So it's less sugar, but more sweet. And likewise, broccoli to me, I would pick broccoli over Doritos any day. But when I was a kid growing up, I would love Doritos and I hated broccoli. So my experience of nature also, I used to think nature was somewhere else. Like I had to go to the Grand Canyon or I had to go to the woods. But my, I mean, there's far too few trees in New York City, but I connect with nature much more now than I used to. Like I took a a foraging tour of a park. So this guy leads people, he's been doing this for decades. He leads people through and shows the edible plants that this was in Prospect Park in Brooklyn, but he does it for different parks. And I learned about all these different edible plants that are around. And he said some of them were invasive species. He's like, you're doing everyone a favor the more you eat. So I was like, oh, you don't have to tell me twice to eat something that is delicious. So it's like some mints and some garlicky flavored plants that were growing on the ground, uh, but also some fruited trees. And it's, I read these books by, there's one like the moral case for fossil fuels, which is talking about why we should use more fossil fuels. And he treats nature as dangerous. Like we have to tame it. We have to defeat it. And indigenous cultures, to my knowledge, view nature as abundant and nurturing. And I'm much more moving in that direction. Like when we pave over nature, we take away something that's abundant in nature and and secure and safe and nurturing and wonderfully curious. Time spent in nature is rejuvenating. Or rather, most of our ancestral history, we lived in a less paved environment than we do today. I'm talking about going back 250,000 years, we've been human. The world we've created now is very anxiety producing. And so the more I connect with even just the little nature that I've access to here, it calms me down. It helps me relax. It puts things in perspective. It helps me connect with people more. These are some of the changes. And then I see that with people around me. So I I have people around us, around me that are more reflective and more, you know, meaning is a bigger part of their life. Less, there's less of the, see, the eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow, for tomorrow we may die. There's nothing wrong with eating, drinking and being merry. It's, if that's all we have, and if, if the, physical pleasures are all we have to take place of the meaning and purpose. That's really empty. So that emptiness, I see that emptiness around me. I see how much emptiness I had before this, especially when I'd hear and read the news about environmental problems. But now those things make us enthusiastic to help people reach that joy and meaning and purpose and discovery and liberation. So, Josh, you have been a prolific podcaster yourself. If you were to recommend three best episodes on your show, what three episodes would you recommend for me and my listeners to listen to? Episode 000. So before episode one, episode zero is the introduction to everything. So that's the, the best one to start with. Then episode 500 was a big milestone. And by that point, I'd done it, done it enough and had developed the Spodok method. So it would it talked about how, how the strategy was evolving and what I was doing. And then I have to say, if you, if you go to, I mean, the, the, the podcast is at joshuaspodak.com slash podcast. And if you click all episodes, scan through and look for people whose names you recognize. Or there's also, um, 
a link to the most popular downloads. And that tends to be people that people have heard of, like best-selling authors and people with TED Talk views of hundreds of millions. And and so can I pick a favorite guest? Nope. They're great. They're all wonderful. But 000 and 500, those are really great ones to start with. 000 and 500 and they go long list to look into. Yeah. Three change makers you are in awe of it. Yeah. If I look at sustainability, I, it's tough to find them. There's many voices in sustainability. I don't see any of them leading. I don't see any of them trying to live sustainably. So I go back in time to like some big people for me, people who went against resistance and changed the world in a way that was meaningful and valuable for them. And it looked really hard. So Muhammad Ali is a big example for me. When he, not, as a boxer, yeah, he was, he was a huge boxer and he was slowly opposing the Vietnam War. And at the time, no celebrities had voiced opinions against the Vietnam War. After all, the U.S. had won, you know, this was the army that beat Hitler. And he was drafted by the army and he resisted being drafted as a conscientious objector. And so the government prosecuted him and they took away his boxing license and they took away his passport. So he couldn't, at the prime of his career, he couldn't box. And a lot of people were saying, just shut up and box. You're an athlete. You're not supposed to have a voice. And he stuck with it. Or he had much, much less income. Ultimately, the Supreme Court voted eight to nothing with one abstention to overturn the conviction. He beat the entire U.S. government in, in a certain sense. And I think he was a great, great boxer. But I think what really makes him one of the great figures of the 20th century was that he stuck by his principles. After him, many other celebrities spoke out against Vietnam. But I think that action of his was huge. So he's a big motivation for me for for doing what he felt was right and being vindicated in the long run, because I think most people did agree. It came to agree with with him. And every athlete now who speaks publicly, I think, is in the shadow of of Muhammad Ali. Another big one is Thomas Clarkson. So abolitionism in England was in and globally was a big case of global cultural change. People had been slavery had been around for 10,000 years in every culture, everywhere, all the time. And the small group of people, I think it started in Philadelphia. I mean, slaves had already had always not wanted to be slaves, but a movement to end slavery. I traced some, there was a lot that happened in Philadelphia where I grew up, but in England, Thomas Clarkson, William Wilberforce, they helped lead England to become the first country to outlaw first the slave trade uh, and then slavery in the early 1800s. And that was pushing against huge resistance. And just a few people changed the greatest empire the world had ever seen. And to my knowledge, every country in the world has laws against slavery now, and it can trace itself back to a few people. So Thomas Clarkson is one of the biggest figures there. Now I'm going to take, I'm going to give another one that's kind of weird, might be kind of weird because I can't actually name this person, but talking about people who change culture through individual actions that probably face resistance, but now we can't imagine any other way. There was some woman who was the first woman to wear pants in the West. And I've looked this up and I, we don't really know who the first one was or why she would do it. And it, it's not really hard to do in terms of physical, you know, just put on a pair of pants. I wouldn't be surprised if, if she had, um, Angst thrown at her or tomatoes thrown at her, something like that for the vitriol that people pushed against. And do you know a woman who has not worn pants? I mean, this woman or small group of women have influenced billions of people, billions through a relatively simple act. And it's, it can be so simple. So I can't name that person, but she existed. Yeah. Powerful example. So thanks for sharing that. Continuing on three micro experience to start a sustainable journey. Well, I would say do the Spodic method. I, I wouldn't focus on small. I would focus on intrinsic. And there's really every focus on like, here's a little thing you can do is it's not based on what the person really wants to do. If people want the world to be cleaner, find out that want, find out that that intrinsic motivation and activate that. So the Spodic method is the best way I know to do that. But if it's compliance, I'm not I'm not interested in people complying with with me telling them what to do. It's learn the Spodic method. And contact me. I mean, the workshop is like the is a way to do it with a cohort, with a group of people. But I'm just finishing up the workbook that people can. I can't offer it just yet, but within a, a week or two. Actually, if people don't mind that it's still being edited, I can share with them copies of it. And so, just email me uh, if you go to joshuaspoder.com in the upper right corner. There's contact, so it's very easy to contact me through my page. Easy to find on LinkedIn. Then I can send you a copy if you want to learn the Spodic method and do the Spodic method with a couple of people and have them do it back to you. And then you do stuff for your intrinsic reasons. And I predict you'll find it meaningful. And I predict you'll want to do more. And I predict you'll be pleasantly surprised that it was easier than you thought, even if the first thing is, well, actually, oftentimes the first, I had one guy say, I'm going to switch to being vegan. He'd been meaning to do it for a long time. And it was a life, lifelong switch. 
Anyway, so I don't go for micro. I go for intrinsic. And the Spodic method is my, is my best way of doing it. And contact me if someone wants to learn it better than I can convey in a podcast conversation. What three books would you recommend for people to have more awareness around sustainability and environmental challenges, futures of it? What are three book recommendations? Well, I wouldn't write my book. Now, I mentioned the, the workbook for the Spodic method, but that's the, that's the companion book to the book Sustainability Simplified which yesterday was my last, was a big deadline for copy editing and it should be available in August. But if people are interested earlier and they don't mind something still being edited, if they contact me and are genuinely interested and can demonstrate that this is something really meaningful to them, I can share copies earlier of, you know, the manuscript, it's basically done. But this book is, it's as far as I can tell, a different, a different approach to sustainability than any other. It's not about like, here's how the Amazon is dying and here's how the coral reefs are bleaching and here's how the carbon dioxide levels and, and here's all these facts and facts and facts and lecture and lecture and lecture. And here's what you have to do to, it's, it's about what's really going on inside of us. People are like the early readers are just overwhelmed with the, how much it connects with what's going on. So, okay, this, that's, this, that, that book of mine. For people who are scientifically minded, this guy, Tom Murphy is a professor of physics. He's now retired. Uh, UC San Diego. He went to Caltech where he got his PhD. And he taught a class in energy for undergrad non-science majors. And he wrote a textbook on it. And it's free. It's a free download. And I call it the science book of the decade. It's it really... And, and by the way, it's it's for students in, in, in college. So there, it's got problems to solve. But he's got like an outline that you can read that gets you most of the... Um, without having to solve all the problems. But I have a PhD in physics. So for me, solving the problems was fun. But Tom Murphy's book, I forget the exact title, but if you search through my blog or search through his, uh, it's like energy ambitions on a finite planet. Yes, energy and human ambitions on a finite planet. Yeah, and it's a free download. So, and it's, you know, it's share and share alike. So you can share it with anyone you want. Then Limits to Growth is the other book that is, I've, I've seen lots of criticisms of it and no criticism has ever shown that the person actually read the book or understood it. But that's a book of looking at our economy and, and environment through a systems perspective. And it's for really comprehensive study. It's, I think, the best. Although there's another book that I can't help mention for if when people are living in difficult times, how do you still maintain a wonderful perspective on life? And Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning is, and people often ask me, how do you stay hopeful? I'm like that question was answered long ago. Viktor Frankl. Man's Search for Meaning. I mean, he was in Auschwitz with, under the Nazis. Whatever our problems are today, we're not being tortured by Nazis in Auschwitz. And he t- wrote about bliss and love. And he was no more or less human than we are. So that's one of the great books on how to create and find meaning in life, even under great adversity. Great share there, Josh. The last of the power of three round. What are three ideas that you're excited about? that would make a significant impact on the world around in the next couple of years? Well, it's product method. That's why I'm so dedicated to it because it's uh, this mindset shift followed by continual improvement that my, the, the workshop participants as alumni share with me things that they're doing. And it's just incredible. A couple of them have started like dinners that they do regularly where they bring people over and, and there's no packaging allowed. So they're sharing with people how they're living and inviting them in and they do the Spodic method with this group and it spreads. And like one of them, she started getting support from her local Extinction Rebellion group. And I think of Extinction Rebellion as like stopping traffic in London and getting people annoyed at them. And this is something that is bring joy and, and it's old, young, rich, poor, whatever backgrounds. I, and that's the biggest thing that I could see really changing. Two other things. I'm not sure because there's stuff outside of sustainability, but I don't know. That's just the one big thing. That's why I'm so dedicated to it. Dedicated and passionate about it. As far as I can tell, it's the biggest problem we face. I mean, if someone wants to work in nuclear disarmament, I'm not going to stop them. If they want to work on how to stop the next pandemic, I'm not going to stop them. But people who say, well, I got to pay the bills. So I'm going to go to work at this advertising company or build cars or whatever. There's so much. You're not going to be able to change culture from within culture. You've got to act on it. 
that's one of the main differences between leadership and management. Managers work within systems, leaders create systems. And if we're going to change the system, it's got to come from leadership. So we talk about leadership here, and you have done a lot of interviews on your podcast. Are there interviews that has particularly changed your way of thinking, or has it opened up new perspectives for you? Oh man, they all do. I love to talk about all of them. I'll just pick one. There is some um, Colonel Mark Reed is a department head at West Point Academy. So this is the United States Military Academy at West Point, one of the premier leadership institutions in the world. It's military. And this guy, he's a colonel. He loves his country. He loves his family. He's very Christian. He loves his, his religion. And when I walked him through to do this, he committed to going for one month producing half as much garbage as he normally would. And we didn't think about it. That, and he said he... He couldn't commit his wife and kids to it because they weren't there. So I said it's subject to them to them going along with it. So I talked to him a month later because he said he was going to reduce the garbage by half for one month. And I said, how did it go? And he said, you know, it was December and December means Christmas. And Christmas is a huge holiday for him and his family, including lots of gifts. And the gifts have lots of wrapping, wrapping paper and, and packaging and so forth. So he sits down his family down and says, what are we going to do here? And they worked things through as a family and the kids came up with ideas that, that they played around with and workshopped. And finally, they, they had the idea they weren't going to do any gifts, no material gifts. Instead, they decided to take a staycation. So they went to a nearby hotel and just stayed there for, I forget if it was a week or a few days. And the gift was each other's full time, undistracted uh, by the regular things of life. Oh, nice. And he said, Josh, I can't speak for them, but I think I can tell you that we all agreed this was the best Christmas we've ever had. And that was not because, that was not despite having no gifts. That was because no material gifts. And I often talk, I, I talk about him in my book and I talk about him as my one man wrecking crew because so many people, people give so many excuses. Oh, I can't, Josh, my family won't go for it. My wife and my husband and my kids, it's too hard. Kids make it impossible. Or uh, my job doesn't allow it. Or my religion. Uh, there's lots of people, reasons people give. Well, he's got a wife, he's got kids. He talked to them and led them. You know, I wasn't there for the conversation, but he got them on board. They supported it. Then for, I mean, Christmas is all about giving. And he was able to find a way to interpret and understand that giving to be just as much as ever. And his job, he agreed as a colonel, as when he joined the military, he would give his life for his country. That's how much it meant to him. He would not do anything that would stand in the way of national security, of him being able to defend his nation and, and the principles it stands for. And sustainability, at least this first step, improved that for him. So all these excuses people give, when they actually act, you get more of your deepest values. So I oh, could give a similar level of story about any guest. That's a beautiful story that you shared, Josh. Thanks so much for that. So Josh, before we wrap up, I would want you to kind of share your words of advice for all of our listeners by means of find your delicious. What is your find your delicious message for all of our listeners? Well, at the beginning, I said find your delicious because my first experiment was with food. What I've learned is that home cooked tastes better even when it tastes worse. And that was at the beginning, I said find your delicious. Now it's moved to a lot more meaning and purpose. I, you've heard me say those words a lot. And liberation, a lot of liberation is that when we feel trapped, when we feel we can't do anything except what everyone around us does, not very satisfying. And when we learn that we can act on these intrinsic motivations, it's very liberating. We face resistance from family, from friends, from job, from lots of different places. That's temporary. Oh, and also from internal, that's withdrawal. When we quit a dependence or an addiction, it's difficult. There are these challenges. Many of us don't look past those challenges. On the other side of those challenges is living by our values, finding meaning and creating meaning and purpose, creating community, finding mutual support, liberation and freedom. It's all there. And our culture, I don't want to be too down, but our culture really does not value those things. It doesn't support those things. It does in some areas. But with regard to the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the shared, all these shared commons, we're not so good in these areas. And there's a lot more meaning and purpose to be had. And it's, it's a joy. It's, it's lovely. It, it tastes better even when it tastes worse. 
find your delicious there. Yeah, find your delicious. And then beyond the delicious, there's liberation. Liberation. There's freedom. Yeah. There's joy. Josh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Before we sign off, this show is all about creating ripples of inspiration. What's your inspire someone today message to all of our listeners? Learn the Spodic method. Practice it. Practice it with others and have them practice it with you. Reconnect with the evoke and what's the word like unearth? These motivations inside us that we generally say, oh, I wish I could, but I can't. And you find that when you do, and the sweat method uses it, it's really like, why didn't I do this earlier? How can I bring this to others? Go out there, have a lookout for the sport method and start your own journey of creating a sustainable life. On that note, Josh, thank you so much for taking time and sharing your experience with me and my listeners. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Inspire Someone today. This is Srikanth, your host, signing off. Until next time, continue to carry the ripples of inspiration. Stay inspired, keep spreading the light.